In this video, we're exploring three chilling cave tales, each with its own unique horrors. One of these narratives entails a terrifyingly tight squeeze, a scenario straight out of nightmares. Contrastingly, the other two stories showcase some of the grandest cave dives found anywhere on Earth. As always, viewer discretion is advised. Today, let me introduce you to one such narrative, a horror fiction podcast and YouTube channel set amidst the desolate polar night of Svalbard known as the White Vault. The White Vault is an audio story, but with a full voice cast. It follows an international rescue and repair team dispatched to uncover the source of a mysterious signal at a remote Arctic research station. During their mission, they become ensnared when the weather takes a treacherous turn and they stumble upon unsettling discoveries lurking beneath the ice. What sets the White Vault apart is its immersive quality, making you feel as if you're trudging alongside the team through the sunless Arctic expanse. The creators of the show meticulously ensure scientific, linguistic, oral, and cultural accuracy. Listeners encounter languages like Icelandic, Arabic, Portuguese, Mandarin, and even endangered ones like Manchu and Yiddish. Moreover, the White Vault incorporates genuine audio recordings of endangered species like polar bears and Andean condors. The entire story is now available, allowing you to delve into all the collected rewards without waiting for new releases. Additionally, a new season is accessible on Spotify following a pair of photographers in rural Maine. On April 5th, 1999, Robert, his brother and a friend of theirs spent a night camping in a cave known as Hermit Cave. The trio ventured into the Woodland Park area near Fort Gibson Lake in Oklahoma, eager to explore caving for the first time. Hermit Cave's exact location remains elusive, and given the outcome of the story, perhaps it's for the best that it remains obscure. 200 million years ago, Oklahoma and its environs were submerged underwater as part of an ancient sea. As the waters receded and evaporated, they left behind vast deposits of minerals. Subsequent geological processes brought the underlying gypsum layer closer to the surface. Gypsum, being relatively soft and soluble, gave rise to the caves dotting Oklahoma and its surroundings. Some of these caverns boast stunning crystal formations, but Hermit Cave is a far cry from such beauty. Its entrance resembles little more than a dirt-covered crevice, a mere two feet wide and three feet long, with the interior equally unimpressive. Following a night of camping nearby, Robert and his brother, undeterred by their friend's departure for work, decided to embark on some exploration. Though inexperienced, Robert was keen to venture into Hermit Cave and see how far it extended. However, his lack of expertise was evident. He was ill-prepared, clad in jeans and a t-shirt, equipped with only a single flashlight and devoid of a helmet or backup light. Likely unaware of the cave's poor air circulation, Robert forged ahead with his brother, maneuvering through increasingly tight passages. As Robert delved deeper, the passageway constricted further until he found himself wedged in a narrow side passage, struggling to draw a full breath. Despite his efforts to push forward, Robert reached an impasse, fully trapped, with his face just inches above the damp cave floor. After futile attempts to free himself, his brother's rescue efforts proved fruitless. With no alternative, his brother reluctantly left to seek help, leaving Robert in a precarious position. Rescue teams and paramedics arrived promptly, guided by Robert's brother to the cave's modest opening. Over several arduous hours, they excavated dirt and rocks to widen the passage sufficiently to extricate Robert, all while ensuring a fresh supply of air due to the cave's poor ventilation. Moreover, even the most slender paramedic struggled to draw full breaths partway to the restriction. Finally, they reached Robert at 3 p.m., five hours after he became trapped, and tragically, he was deceased. Face down in the mud, Robert appeared to have succumbed to suffocation. His body was eventually extricated from the cave, but it remains unclear whether he lost consciousness due to the poor air quality or simply couldn't maintain his position above the mud any longer. On the other hand, the tallest, most imposing mountain in the Canadian Rockies is Mount Robson, towering at almost 13,000 feet or 4,000 meters. A few miles east of Mount Robson lies another peak, Trio Mountain, considerably less imposing in height. 
However, it's what lies within Trio Mountain that's remarkable. The sole road traversing this exceedingly remote mountainous expanse is the Yellowhead Highway sitting at an elevation of 3,000 feet or 914 meters. Nearly 4,000 feet higher, nestled on the slopes of Trio Mountain, lies the entrance to Canada's second deepest cave, Arctimese Cave. Plunging 1,760 feet, 536 meters deep, it ranks among the deepest caves on Earth. Not only is it vast, but it's also incredibly challenging to access. The journey on foot, until the 20-kilometer trek through forests and around mountains from the highway, typically spanning several days. Although helicopter transport offers a more efficient option, it's often prohibitively expensive. Furthermore, Arctimese's depth is just one aspect of its difficulty. The descent is divided into two sections, the first of which is aptly named the Endless Climb. This section comprises steep inclines and sheer vertical shafts, many filled with icy runoff from the surrounding mountains and glaciers. On the afternoon of October 17, 1991, Rick Black, Chris Zimmerman, Hugo Mulek, and Ron LaSalle prepared for airlift to Arctimese Cave's entrance. Rick, Chris, and Hugo, all seasonal rangers at Mount Robson Provincial Park, along with experienced caver Ron, were sent for the expedition. Upon being dropped by helicopter near Arctimese Cave's entrance, they promptly established base camp before dividing into two teams. Rick and Chris ventured in first, followed three hours later by Ron and Hugo with plans to rendezvous later on. For hours, they descended deeper into the cavernous depths, reaching a depth of around 1,300 feet or 400 meters by 11.30 that night, where they encountered a vertical shaft known as the Refresher. Though not the most intimidating drop, at 29 feet between the ledge and the floor below, the Refresher posed a challenge due to the icy waterfall cavers had to rappel down and ascend through, inevitably soaking them. Secured to the rope, they descended one by one. However, Tragedy struck when Rick's weight dislodged an unstable 400-kilogram boulder crossing his pelvis and rendering him unconscious. The others rushed to his aid, relieved to find him alive, but grappling with the intensity of his injuries. Lacking proper medical resources, their options were limited. Attempting to carry Rick proved futile, prompting the decision to split up. Chris stayed with Rick while Hugo and Ron set out to seek help. Their mission was daunting. Emerging from Arctimese was just the beginning. With no means to contact the helicopter pilot, Hugo and Ron had to climb out of the cave, trek 20 kilometers to the highway, and flag down assistance. Their journey back to the cave entrance alone consumed almost five hours. By the time they reached the highway, 14 hours had elapsed since they left Rick and Chris trekking through the forest throughout the night. Left alone, Chris huddled beside Rick to stave off hypothermia in the freezing depths, enveloped in pitch darkness, conserving their dwindling light sources. There was little more they could do than to shiver and await help's arrival. As soon as the RCMP were alerted to Rick's ordeal on the afternoon of October 18th, they sprang into action on multiple fronts. The provincial government dispatched three planes to Vancouver Island to transport cavers with rescue training to assist in Rick's rescue. Recreational cavers from across the region also converged to offer their aid. At first, light on the morning of October 19th, almost 36 hours after the incident, a helicopter dropped off the initial rescuers, shuttling back and forth to ferry more personnel. While some rescue teams were transported, Others established a command center with tents in the valley below the cave. Regrettably, Rick and Chris remained oblivious to the flurry of activity outside the cave aimed at their rescue and hope dwindled on the morning of the 19th. Their shivering intensified and Chris, despite being injured, deteriorated alongside Rick. Approximately 30 hours into the ordeal, Rick urged Chris to leave the cave, recognizing that they were both perilously close to death. Though initially reluctant, though initially reluctant, Chris complied, promising to return with help. Sometime around midday, Chris encountered headlamps in the tunnel ahead, signaling the arrival of the first rescuers who rushed to his aid. After providing crucial information about Rick's condition, Chris proceeded to the cave entrance. That afternoon, Chris emerged from the cave entrance and was promptly attended to by emergency personnel. He was stabilized before being airlifted to a nearby hospital for treatment of hyperthermia. 
Around the same time, rescuers equipped with medical supplies, heating pads, and dry clothing reached Rick, but tragically, they arrived too late. Rick had passed away shortly before their arrival, eliciting tears from many of the rescue team members who knew him well. In the aftermath, the rescue operation transitioned into a recovery mission. It took several teams of 10 individuals two additional days to carry Rick's body out of Arctimus Cave. An autopsy revealed that there was no scenario in which Rick could have survived his injuries sustained from the boulder. The rescue within Arctimus Cave stands as the most extensive in Canadian history. Despite the efforts of the rescue teams, Rick's fate was sealed the moment the rock slipped, inflicting catastrophic injuries that proved fatal. To this day, Devil's Hole, situated along the border of California and Nevada, remains shrouded in mystery. More than a thousand years ago, Native Americans from the Timbisha Shoshone tribe settled in the Mojave Desert where Devil's Hole resides. Despite its inhospitable environment, they thrived with some of their descendants still living in the area today. Devil's Hole, characterized by a crystal clear geothermal pool at its base, was the subject of legend among the tribe who spoke of water babies inhabiting its depths. While modern science has provided natural explanations for its existence, much about Devil's Hole remains unknown. In 1965, the allure of Devil's Hole captivated 19-year-old Paul Gian Conteri, a cafeteria worker at a Nevada nuclear test site. After a year of anticipation, Paul, along with friends David Rose and brothers Bill and Jack Atler, embarked on a journey to Devil's Hole on June 20th. Despite its designation as a restricted area, Devil's Hole beckoned as an enigmatic geological wonder believed to be one of the world's deepest caves. Its water, sourced from underground tunnels linked to areas where nuclear tests were conducted, flows slowly over millennia, making it historically significant. Moreover, Devil's Hole serves as a natural seismic activity detector with earthquakes triggering tsunamis at its entrance minutes later, spanning the Western Hemisphere and reaching as far as Asia. Yet much about Devil's Hole remains shrouded in mystery, captivating the imagination and curiosity of explorers like Paul and his companions. The primary reason for protecting Devil's Hole is the presence of a tiny fish species known as the Devil's Hole Pumpfish. These inch-long, bright blue fish are endemic to Devil's Hole and have likely inhabited the pool for at least 20,000 years. Their origin in the pool remains unclear, but they spawn in the shallow limestone entrance and spend their lives between the surface and depths of 80 feet, feeding on algae. To safeguard the pupfish, President Harry Truman added the area around Devil's Hole to Death Valley National Park in 1952. Subsequently, professional diver Jim Hout conducted a series of dives at Devil's Hole during the early 1960s, mapping out its layout and making significant discoveries. Jim's exploration revealed various chambers and features, including the funnel and aqueous chasm, but he never reached the true bottom of Devil's Hole. Inspired by Jim's descriptions, 19-year-old Paul John Conteri and his companions embarked on a dive at Devil's Hole in 1965. Despite its restricted status, they entered the pool without proper equipment or training. While exploring, one member signaled a need to surface due to low air supply, prompting two to ascend, while the third, Paul, vanished. Concerned for Paul's safety, his companions attempted to locate him but found no sign of him. Despite their efforts, Paul and another diver, David Rose, never resurfaced. A frantic search involving law enforcement, park rangers, and professional divers ensued, but tragically, the bodies of Paul and David were never recovered. The search revealed only a mask, snorkel, and flashlight tied to a rock, indicating the direction of the exit. Divers also discovered a section known as the Infinity Room, reaching a depth of 932 feet without touching the bottom. Despite the extensive efforts, the search was eventually called off, leaving the fate of Paul and David unresolved even decades later. Thank you for tuning into this tragic yet fascinating story. If you found this video informative or engaging, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to our channel for more content just like this. Don't forget to turn on notifications so you never miss an update. If you feel compelled to support our channel even further, you can now use the Super Thanks feature to show your appreciation. Your support helps us continue creating content that we hope you'll enjoy. Once again, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.